Hello and welcome to the launch of Petra Buskin's most recent book, <laughs> Modern Motherhood and Women's Dual Identities. I'd like to acknowledge that this event is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and to any elders from any other communities who are here today. Now, many of you might be familiar with the opening line of Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. And so on it goes. Of course, this quote is about a period of time in Europe before the French Revolution. It was the best of times because it promised an end to the tyranny of the nobility and the rising up of the common people. It was also the worst of times because a lot of sacrifices had to be made by the common people to achieve this, to achieve this end as many measures were taken to squash the uprising. The best of times, the worst of times, just like life really, just like being a parent and just like writing PhD. <laughs> My name is Rebecca and I'm your MC tonight and tonight we're here to celebrate the best of times, an extraordinary achievement from an extraordinary woman, Yay. Petra Buskins. <laughs> I've known Petra for 16 years and during that time I've watched her do so much including the, com the completion of the PhD, and now the publishing of that work in this wonderful new book. The best of times and the worst of times. Of course, these are grand, overarching, binary words. And within the best of times and the worst of times are just, well, just the times. Times when people just live and do the things they need to do. Write a PhD, publish a book, um, work in academia, raise a family, write opinion pieces, work as a psychotherapist, run a household, attend to the needs of children that span an age, an age range of 24 years, look after the chooks, get the veggies in, fall in love, get the kids on the school bus, buy a small farm, etc, etc. These are the best of times and sometimes the worst of times. And in order to weather and survive during the best and the worst of times, it takes guts and tenacity and an ability to be truly robust and resilient to be Petra Buskins. Yes. <laughs> so let's skip back in time. So uh, back in 2002, my daughter Lucille kept talking about this girl that she'd met at school, this girl called Mia. And could we have Mia over? And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Let's have this Mia over. I hadn't met Mia. But um, it was organised. Actually, Tony did the organising. He, he had met Petra and he came home and said, oh, yes, I've met Petra and, and Mia and they're going to come over. And I thought, oh, that sounds terrific. And on the day that, uh, that Mia was coming over, where is Mia? Where is she? There's a little wave, Mia. And on the day that... On the day that it was all organised for Mia to come over, um, I was working, so Tony went down to the school to pick up Mia and, and our daughters and, and bring them home again. And um, I was um, working, I was in doing uh, private tuition at the time. I, I work in theatre and I used to do a lot of, I was doing a lot of work in the community as a, as a, as a writer and a theatre maker. But I was also doing private tuition in speech and drama for children from the studio at my home, which is, a, which is actually a very flash... Uh, Explain uh, description of the spare room at my house, which had no heating. <laughs> anyway, my kids knew that if the door was shut, that meant that I was with uh, uh, with a student doing speech and drama work. And so the door was shut, but I saw the, to the doorknob turn, and I looked up, and I saw the door creak open, and there was this little round, smiling <laughs> face. And I looked up, and I caught the eye of that little face, and they quickly shut the door. <laughs> and I thought, that's a little Mia. That's a little Mia Buskins. <laughs> and that was how I first met this this charming this charming girl of, of Petrus 
And I came out, you know, the, the student left and I came out and we chatted and, and Mia said, my mum's coming to pick me up. And I said, well, that's great. We love a mum who comes to pick up. That goes really well in Dalesford. And um, I looked out the window and I saw this old Mazda 626, blue Mazda 626 pull up. And I thought, yeah, classic, single woman, single mum car. And um, I watched him. It was a laser. A laser, my mistake, my mistake, the old laser. Um, I've driven that laser. I, I looked out and I looked out and, and out stood this woman and she kind of did this. And she had blonde hair and she zipped up a parka and she walked up my driveway and she was in tight jeans and boots and a zipped up parka and I thought, well, hello. <laughs> in my mind I went, it's the woman from the cafe. The woman from the cafe. And I opened the door and she looked at me and she said, oh, it's the woman from the cafe. And we both knew each other. We'd seen each other for weeks, for a few months actually at the cafe, but we didn't know each other. We knew nothing about each other and I'd see her at the cafe and I'd think what is she doing she was always writing she had books there and a computer and sometimes she'd catch her eye and sometimes she'd give us a little smile or she'd laugh at our jokes you know, so she's a bit of an eavesdropper <laughs> and that night she stayed for dinner and I got to know Petra and I got to know so much about her and that we both had a, a love of people and knowledge and ideas and also a love of dancing um, I've been out dancing a few times with Petra in fact um, I, I I hurt my hip really badly once I, I went to the chill out dance party with Petra and I have to say that Petra's a good 10 years younger than I am and all night, uns, 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 me and Petra, and I put my hip out. For five weeks I was down for five weeks with that hip with Petra, so careful if she wants to trip the light fantastic tonight. Um, and Petra and I became regulars at the cafe and there are many from the cafe that are here to, to, uh, tonight and we were a motley crew and we were a motley crew of people that uh, will drop our kids at school or just people who were looking for, for conversation. Some people find it at Friday night at the pub and some people found it at Kukla, which is a cafe in the main street of town. And I think some people thought that we were up ourselves and that we thought that we were the intelligentsia of Dalesford. <laughs> but it was just that we loved the conversation. And um, that group of people, we, we went through an enormous amount of things together and they were the best of times. But we also don't want to slip into romantic nostalgia. Sometimes they were the worst of times. I only had one row with someone in Dalesford the whole time I lived there, and that was at Kukla. Right in the main street there, I had a big old barney with someone about something to do with the Greens. It was so ludicrous. And I got asked to leave. Um, but they were the best of times because we shared so many ideas, but also the worst of times. Some of those friendships didn't last, and some of those people are no longer with us. They, 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 they've passed away. But with Petra, it was a wonderful, we, we all felt her, her glow and her glory and her amazing ability for conversation. And the thing about her conversation is that we all know that, that, that Petra is, is an immense intellect. And, but with her conversation, she could talk about anything in real lay terms. So she would charm us all with her wit and her intelligence. And the other thing that she did was that she'd look at us individually and talk to us as though we were the most important <laughs> person in the room. And it's mesmerising. And we all fell for it. We all loved it. We all adored it. We all went, when I'm with Petra, I'm so smart. <laughs> and we, we, we totally loved that. And we talked we talked about many, many things. And sometimes the conversation were hard. Well, sometimes the conversations were hard because though it was the best of times, it was also the worst of times. We talked about our, all of us had passions to be professionals, to, to, to be working, but we were also parenting and the, the, you know, the, at times the contradiction between those two things. I remember saying to Petra at one stage, I wish I'd never become a feminist, I wish I wasn't feminised because then I could just be at home with the kids and I'd have nothing to grapple with, but of course that, that except my own mind, <laughs> the of my mind. Um, and, you know, and sometimes Petra really, really grappled with the PhD and, and we would talk about, you know, whether we would should hang up the pen, hang up the pen and we decided that, that that would not be a good thing to do. And during that time, Petra displayed immense resilience, immense resilience. And I want to acknowledge Rolf and Jenny at this point because I think for, for every person who shows great strength and great character, there's often wonderful family behind them. So Rolf and Jenny, I hope you're very proud of your wonderful, your, your wonderful daughter.
and also to Sarah, Petra's best friend, who so graciously shared her friendship with so many people. Many friends would become incredibly jealous of the friendships that Petra, um, the, the many people that fell in love with Petra, but Sarah didn't. So Sarah, to you, you know, what a, what a great gift of friendship. And to Nick for being such a, a wonderful friend and, and comrade and for building the family um, and the farm and the chooks and the veggies and the dogs and the children, all the things that Petra was was looking for. They were they were it was wonderful that um, that you were both there during her journey. Now I have a confession, I actually haven't read the book um, fully as yet, but I have skimmed and um, but I've read the reviews and the words used by the reviewers are all so similar. This is a masterful new work, lucid, timely, important, illuminating. Petra Buskins is really on to something incredibly important and generally overlooked. A fascinating and compelling study, sophisticated and absorbing read. And tonight, friends, you can buy this sophisticated, <laughs> compelling and absorbing read right here at Readings for a wonderful discount for $100. And Petra herself will sign your copy. So you two can take can home this sophisticated, this sophisticated read. Now, in order to prepare for tonight, like I know a lot about Petra and we've shared a lot of stories and I know her well, but I thought, you know, I better get on the, on the interweb and have a bit of a Google. So I got on and I thought I'll have a bit of a look and see what I can find and a number of things came up and there were documents I'd seen before. But one caught my eye, it said Petra Buskins, Dalesford Primary School. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if she's done a PD down there at the school. I thought that sounds great. And so I opened it, I found the, the, the PDF and I opened it and there was Petra's name beside the school canteen roster. <laughs> so November the 5th, and when I told Petra, she said it's actually been moved to November the 28th. So they are the best of times and the worst of times. Tonight, to officially launch this new work by Petra Buskins is Anne Mann. Anne is one of Australia's most penetrating cultural critics. A former columnist for The Australian and The Age, she now writes longer essays, such as the cover piece in the May edition of The Monthly this year, Great Domestic Hopes, How the Economy Free, free Rides on Women's Unpaid Work. Her books include Motherhood, a, walk, a Walkley finalist, a quarterly essay, Love and Money, a memoir, So This Is Life, and the best-selling, The Life of I, The New Culture of Narcissism. She's now writing a new book on child sexual abuse. Her, chap her chapter, The Quest for Social Justice for Mothers, is just out in a new book, Dangerous Ideas About Mothers, edited by Camilla Nelson and Rachel Robertson. Please welcome Anne Mann to officially launch Modern Motherhood and Women's Group. Serious, and I think this book deserves a serious introduction and a serious reading. Um, I read, I write um, because of the precision it offers and then I read, so excuse me if I um, do read from the script. Anne Summers has just brought out a memoir called Unfettered and Alive. It's a triumphant account of her highly successful career which defied the then rather dismal expectations of a woman in the 1950s and 60s as she came of age who was expected to marry and have children and, as she puts it, to be invisible except for living through those people, husband, children, that she supported. Meanwhile, another leading feminist, Jane Caro, has a new book out early next year. It's called The Accidental Feminist and it acknowledges a new cohort of confident and economically independent women, like Anne Summers, but she also acknowledges there's another group of forgotten women whose plight is perilous. Here's what Jane says, the book's to come, but there's a whole uh, blurb and I've just spoken with her somewhere so I know something for argument. The fastest growing group, Jane says, among the homeless is women over 55. Women retire with half the super uh, that men do. A third of women retire with no super at all. For some women over 50, the reward of a lifetime of paid work, domestic labour, and particularly caring for others, is a penurious old age. To which we should add single mothers, as Petra once was, who under harsh neoliberal policies have been more and more plunged into poverty. 
so that currently their poverty rates are hovering around between 20 and 5th um, and 25% a full quarter. And of course, even those who are not below the poverty line are still struggling. Um, this is compared with 10% of poverty rate overall. So on the one hand, we may say, as individuals, women can lead lives now of freedom as never before. But on the other hand, all this data is telling us that women who are mothers are more likely to be poor. How can we find an explanation for such st a stark disparity in fates? And the answer, I suggest, is in Petra Buskin's brilliant new book, Modern Motherhood and Women's Dual Identities, Rewriting the Sexual Contract. And I'm thrilled to be here uh, to launch it today. Petra places at the center her, of her book this simple question. Why are women both free and depressed in late modernity? And what are the causes and consequences of this contradictory duality? Petra's book is theoretically sophisticated, but at the same time, lucid, eloquent, um, and beautifully written. She has uh, an arresting argument. In this new gender contract, um, even if they are fr promised freedom as individuals, they, as mothers, they nonetheless collide with a world where their largely unchanged responsibility for children and care entrenches patterns of gender inequality. The gender wage gap is large part, in large part a motherhood penalty, leaving too many women impoverished in old age due to the care work they perform throughout their lives. This leaves women stranded in unforgiving cultural contradictions, which have only intensified under neoliberalism. She also presents original interviews with couples who break these age-old patterns, and she provides a kind of signposting, a roadmap to how we might transcend the impasse. I'll come back to her argument in a moment. When I first encountered Petra's writing, what I liked about it was it was an unusually thoughtful tone that she had, a quiet independence. And the fact that she's a kind of, uh, I call it an integrationist, she takes complex, seemingly uh, contradictory cultural strands and then she weaves them together into an illuminating synthesis. But I especially liked how she was able to hold another person's perspective, respectfully acknowledging a different position without caric caricaturing it, and that's surprisingly common in public life in Australia, <laughs> while simultaneously holding her own position steady. So in this way, she transcended a lot of the feminist tribalism, um, which can get somewhat nasty. <laughs> so Petra is very different from those that Helen Garner described who think like tanks. In fact, she's nuanced, and she's um, always open, it seems to me, to the philosopher Raymond Gator's insight that thinking like a tank is no good because behind a political opponent's position, could well be an echo of something true. Those qualities that Petra has are in abundance in this book. I also think these qualities are inseparable from and intertwined with her very particular life history as a mother, which she has generously and movingly shared in this book. Every writer remarked Isaac Besheva Singer has an address, and Petra in this book shows us her address writer's address. She shares it as a part of her methodological rigour. The interviewer, researcher, writer is not, under feminist theory, a white-coated expert who sits above her research subjects, but is also self-disciplined enough to be reflective, to recognise the way she is shaped by her own uh, subjectivity and her life practice. Petra became a mother unexpectedly in her early 20s to her beloved eldest daughter, Mia, never forget how she's just been described, um, <laughs> receiving uh, her invitation into an honours course and a pregnancy test um, on the same day. <laughs> Petra, this made Petra an outsider. She was an under-resourced single mother, albeit with wonderful family support, and she was living alone with responsibility for a lot of that time with, um, for a child, 24-7, on welfare benefits, um, some of that time, while studying. Compared to what she saw as the responsibility-free life of her young 20-something peers who 
I'll paraphrase, perhaps inaccurately, sound a bit like Janis Joplin, sex, drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> so they were living the extended adolescent of late modernity, the individualist society we all know so well. Meanwhile, Petra writes, I adored my baby girl and took great pleasure in her blossoming self. But she was also an outsider, not just her peers of her own age who were um, travelling and partying and so on, but to the life of the older women who were mothers, who were partnered and married, um, and who seemed to her to be trading off a degree of autonomy and equality in exchange for the cushioning of a male wage. So she saw two different patterns, which she was both an outsider to, but also were, were unsatisfactory. She was also an outsider, even though she's a person of high ability, talent, and high ambition, uh, to the lean in and manage like a man model of the uninterrupted career path, which was rapidly emerging as the default requirement for any woman who wanted to do something with her life outside the private realm with media, business, medicine, law, um, and especially academia, for Petra. She writes, like many mothers, she no longer lived for herself, but rather for the emotional and physical needs of her baby, shaping her study and work around it. Her daily experience of the cultural contradictions of motherhood she writes about in this book was therefore more intense than most. And all the time she was doing it, notwithstanding the sexist idea that on becoming mothers, women's brains turned vegetative mush, <laughs> she was thinking long, hard and deeply. Someone as creative as Petra, I think, can transform difficulty into creativity, outsider's status into insight. In sociology, the virtue of being an outsider has long been extolled. The psychotherapist and sociologist Irene Philipson draws attention in a rave review of Petra's book in the US journal Psychoanalysis, Culture and Society to the sociologist Neil McLaughlin's idea of the optimal outsider. Someone outside the city walls might see things that those within the city walls don't. He says, Optimal, optimally marginal intellectuals have access to the creative core of an intellectual tradition while avoiding organisational, financial, cultural <clears throat> or psychological dependencies that limit innovations. As I see it, Petra has two central vocations. One is as the writer, theorist, feminist, psychotherapist and scholar who's written this book on modern motherhood, and the other is as a mother. In a recent essay, Petra wrote about Weber's idea um, of the spiritualised calling that he, he thought was a vocation. It brings meaning to one's life and ideally a contribution to the world, Petra wrote. However, it is possible, she says, and I think so many mothers would identify with this, it is possible to have more than one calling or central life pursuit. Once children arrive, there isn't really a choice around them being a central life pursuit, at least not for mothers, she says. I experience these two vocations as interwoven. One cross-pollinates the other. It is uh, her vocation as a mother of Mia, and now, in a second phase of motherhood, uh, of equally beloved Sophia and Tom, which has meant that she has taken another of Raymond Gator, the philosopher's ideas, to take your time when it comes to thinking, philosophising and writing. This wonderful book took 10 years of living the problem, uh, as well as the joys of being a mother, the best of times and the worst of times, <laughs> of being at home as well as working sometimes full time, as she did for four years, training as a psychotherapist, doing part-time work, studying and doing original research. Now we all understand slow cooking and how it might make a meal flavor, more flavorful, richer and more nourishing and celebratory of human beings when it is shared than a drive through burger from McDonald's. <laughs> And the principles of McDonaldization, that is rationalisation and speeding up, have especially under neoliberalism colonised far more than the fast food industry. It often seems to me that Wittgenstein, for example, would never in modern academia have been given the time to write his famous philosophical investigations. 
Rather, he would be forced to churn out journal articles because they get more points, avoid a book-length investigation because a book gets fewer points, and presenting his key points in a slick PowerPoint presentation at a conference, <laughs> which gets points. <laughs> so what Petra has given us here, because of the way um, she has been living, so vividly um, described in the introduction, is the richness of slow scholarship. Allowing the intermingling of suspicions <coughs> to give her more insight than might otherwise have been had. Um, the ability to be original, the ability to move outside the silos, narrow silos often of academic speciality, and the cross-fertilisation of ideas from the life practice of being a mother. And she's combined all this into a precise and very serious scholarship. We see fully Petra's vocation as a scholar as she takes us in this book, travelling upstream from the current cultural contradictions of modern motherhood to its source, to the very foundation stones of modern democracy, tracing through 400 years of history, the history of the development of classical liberal thought and the development of the social contract. How women came to both be included in and excluded from the modern social contract. She revisits Carol Pateman's uh, original and resting intervention in democratic theory in uh, Pateman's classic book, The Sexual Contract. Pateman herself is something of an outsider, and I'm interested that Petra has gravitated um, towards her. She was a working class girl who was never expected to complete secondary school, let alone um, uh, go to, first of all, the working man's Ruskin College, then to higher education in Oxford, um, to do brilliantly, and then to write several absolutely brilliant books. And Pateman spent, perhaps as a, as a result of her writer's address, thinking in brilliant, innovative ways around questions of inclusion. Now, I studied and actually taught political theory for a time, um, democratic uh, theory and the development of the social contract at Melbourne University. So I know the area pretty well. In fact, the ghastly task of remembering all my different pin numbers <laughs> is made easy by using um, dates. You're all too nice to hack my <laughs> by using dates um, of the extension of suffrage. So, <laughs> so what, 1832, the Great Reform Act, 1867, which doubled for working men the um, uh, suffrage from one to two million, 1868, which um, extended it to essentially all um, adult men in Britain, um, 1902, very important day in Australia, suffrage for women. This is why I'm wearing my purple today, you see the suffrage colours. Um, and 1928, full suffrage to women in Britain. And it's the only way I can remember them all. <laughs> uh, but it's also a very uplifting way of remembering it because it is such an important thing that uh, we moved away from the divine right of kings, we moved away from autocracy and um, developed a democracy. Petra first gives a very lucid account of Pateman's book and I admit that I was really looking forward to reading it but I didn't expect something new to develop because I knew the work, you know, all of this stuff on um, democratic theory quite well. And first she gives an account and then she does something novel with it. So she shows um, writing about Pateman that has, as the social new social contract emerged, replacing the hierarchical patriarchy embedded in the divine right of kings, um, the move in the move to a fraternal, all men are equal, universalistic doctrine, it was, of course, men who were the only ones who were able to participate as free and autonomous beings in the public sphere. And this happened, as Petra explains, by excluding women. This is Pateman's argument. By women being sequestered in the private realm, producing the next generation and taking care of the sick, the disabled, the elderly and children in the home. So freedom and equality for men then was contingent upon separate spheres on the exclusion of women from the new social contract and it meant inequality for women. These early exclusions from the social contract on the grounds of their sexual, um, reproductive and caregiving capacities are critical, travelling downstream, to the dilemmas contemporary women face, writes Petra, because the very category of individual has always presupposed an existence of a reserve army of flexible dem domestic and emotional labour that women have traditionally performed. And crucially, Petra shows, women cannot call on that same labour. 
with few exceptions, she writes, women cannot call upon that labour because they are that reserved labour. And then here's what's new. Wasn't contrapate a just a story of exclusion? The fact is, as individuals, as that title and the life of Anne Summer show, um, women have actually gradually been able, Petra argues, to take the opportunities offered by um, the new social contract as individuals. It is really on becoming mothers that a new reality bites and an old, largely unchanged sexual contract kicks in. Modernity, she says, has enabled women as individuals but disabled them as mothers. Women are free and they are subordinated. It just depends on which phase of the life course we are looking at. Moreover, such freedom or lack thereof is determined by the presence or absence of a child and the presence or absence of a husband or partner. Something Petra points out is patently not the case for men. Hence, the dilemmas we all face as modern mothers. Women are both meant to be self-supporting, self-fulfilling, autonomous individuals entering the labour market, looking after themselves. They're also meant to be self-sacrificing mothers who take care to put children's needs first so that they fulfil their potential. So they inhabit two distinct worlds where the assumptions of one are turned on their head in the other. A labour market where the assumption is a constant presence because the worker is assumed to have somebody else, a wife, to take care of the everything else. And on the other hand, the assumption of one motherhood, which is also of a constantly present engaged mother whose attentiveness is unconstrained by her obligations as a worker. There, in a nutshell, is the problem. Stated so succinctly. Hence those widespread feelings women have that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, of accusations that you're a failure as a mother if you work and a failure as a mother as a poor role model if you stay at home, uh, the problematic nature of either strategy and the defensiveness and conflict often between women over um, the best way of living. And I think there's an increasing model of effortless perfection in performing both roles and that's the new straitjacket that we really, the new problem with no which hasn't probably been named yet. Being the imperfect employee while raising the perfect child. Mm -hmm. And apart from the psychological burdens of all this, it is why there are so many leakages from the pipeline in all the major professions. Um, when it becomes, the clashes simply become indissoluble, unsolvable and too much and women withdraw from the, the workplace. Yeah, partially or totally. In her book, Rewriting, um, it's, it's in her book, Modern Motherhood, um, Petra also comes, overcomes a very typical and problematic binary in academia, where often academics who are theoretical tend not to be empirical enough, and those who are empirical tend not to be theoretical enough. It's not a, a blanket statement, but it, it is a tendency. So she has an empirical section in the book where she gives an in-depth account of her unstructured and psychologically sensitive interviews um, with a, very, a group that lived a very different life to her. And she was actually studying these women while she was um, attachment parenting Mia, more or less. Um, these mothers who overcome this default position of being the one to do everything on the home front uh, spent longer than av the average work day away from children. So they might spend three days away or they might spend a longer work day. So it, was a way in which they um, were able to work in an uninterrupted, uninterrupted way, but also their partner, um, the father, um, was forced to actually do the kind of emotion work and psychological work that new mothers do, because women don't become a mother by giving birth to a child from their vagina. They just don't, or by breastfeeding they actually become a mother over time and it's learnt on the job and there's a lot of trial and error, actually a lot of error. Um, and you, um, as Sarah Ruddick once said, you make it up as you go along. So by actually leaving altogether, these men had to find out how to do it. So it really did overcome that idea that they were just babysitting, for example, while they became true, um, while the mother was away, they became true caregivers. Just on this point, I was reminded when I read Petra's book on this section of a father who, um, amongst the almost total, uh, totally female population picking up kids from school and waiting for the older kids, um, was one stay-at-home dad. 
and he, we'd have really interesting conversations and we would have mother type conversations where he was, had clearly internalised um, the, all the interest of his child and he was thinking about the next thing that the child needed and um, whether they should learn this and the difficulties they had about this and so on. But it was a very, you know, I moved from the mother's group and this poor waif of a male who was sitting um, by himself <laughs> over there and then we would have um, a mother type conversation. In contrast, I went about the same time to a very eminent gynaecologist, and he had, you know those photos where um, Ali Hochschild, the wonderful American sociologist, notes that men often have very um, posed and formal photos, whereas women have sort of snapshots they've taken themselves of the kids. So there are a lot of photos of, you know, a child draped around a cello or uh, <laughs> another with a violin, and they've clearly been a professional photographer who'd come in and taken these shots of the um, offspring but then he said to me um, there were three children and he said I wasn't interested in them until they learned to speak properly to speak properly and as I was lying on the table he was sort of rummaging in my nether regions I was doing a calculus of just how long just how long with three children it must have been that he wasn't interested in them and I came as a calculation of between um, nine and 15 years. <laughs> this was borne out by the fact that the receptionist was clearly furious with this august personage um, because the wife was forever trying to get appointments with him to sort of get his attention. So anyway, the two contrasts of what it is to really take responsibility for a child. Um, and of course, the very incompatibility of work and home as we currently constructed is seen by the way um, mothers um, who these mothers who left were able to really work in an efficient and productive way when they had um, uninterrupted blocks of time. And I should say that through this um, exploration of mothers who leave, I was again struck by Petra's signature quality. This uncommon psychological poise and her capacity to see other lives fully, in that while she was a single mother attachment parent in Mia, um, a mother who stayed, if you like, she was at the same time imaginatively entering the lives of mother who were, mothers who were living very differently to her without judgment or the need for self-justification. So, as a mother who stayed, she was able to see the revolutionary potential in the lives of those who live. It's in this more empirical section that she also presents the telling evidence of the often dire consequences down the track of the sexual contract over the course of mother's lives, which, um, neoliberalism has made worse. We have only 18 weeks of um, parental leave when it takes about 20 years to raise a child. Um, so care responsibilities are simply not taken account of. Neoliberalism has also installed a rather pernicious idea that whatever befalls anyone but a mother is simply res the result of their free, perhaps foolish choice. It's not a structural problem in urgent need of remedy for which we need solidarity, bold thinking and a social movement to overcome. Rather, motherhood, as Petra says in her book, becomes constructed as an individualised risk. Or to put it in our new Prime Minister's language, in scomo speak, <laughs> you have to have a go to get a go. <laughs> you should make a contribution, not take a contribution. So that poor single mothers and older mothers who are poor and homeless clearly haven't had a go. And they apparently have not made a contribution in raising the next generation. They are leaners, not lifters. Except I point out that Australian Bureau of Statistics figures from 2014 using the most conservative, you know, the most understated form of calculation, show that the contribution to the economy of almost entirely women's unpaid labour is equal to the value of 434 billion or equal to 43 0.5, you know, just under 50% of GDP, the value of GDP. So it's a huge, unrequited contribution to the nation's well-being. Many mothers, Petra says sharply, are only a husband away from poverty. That's true. And it is ultimately motherhood that produces the gender pay gap, which translates into gender poverty. The specific effect on motherhood, on the gender wage gap, is startling. Petra has a lot of really interesting figures that she pulls together to show the consequences um, towards the end of life, uh, but also during the peak child rearing period 
um, of uh, all of the um, difficulties she's been describing. The gender pay gap, gap, pay, pay gap, gap sorry, I'll get it right soon, she shows actually grew to 18% in 2015 and only dropped slightly from that in 2016. But the usual forms of calculation do not take into consideration all sorts of things like after hours work, bonuses which men are more likely to be able to do because they have so much time looking after the children. So during prime childbearing years, Petra shows, the pay gap is nearly 40% or over um, $1,000 a week. The consequences lifelong can be devastating. Superannuation is actually a contributory system, unlike the age pension. Those who have full-time lifelong work benefit the most from it. In 2016, close to 75% of women aged 60 to 64 have balances less than $100,000. Men held 63% of all super balances and women only 36%. Women are estimated through looking after children, the sick and the elderly to work only 28 full-time years compared to men's 38. Now 34% of older women live in permanent income poverty. And the instability of marriage and relationships that Petra also details only adds to mother's vulnerability. As one woman put it in Petra's book, I don't have property, I don't have big savings, I don't have anything behind me. And that's scary for me. Like, is my future living in a dustbin under a bridge somewhere? What Petra shows is that until we invent new forms of maternal citizenship, the work, family, conflict, the inequality that she so powerfully shows will only get worse. Petra's key contention that women are now free as individuals and constrained of, as mothers definitely explains the unfettered and alive of Anne Summers' title and, if I may paraphrase, the fettered and poor subjects of the older mothers of Jane Caro's book. It is as mothers, not as child-free individuals or as individuals in the early uh, part of the life cycle, that women become or are more likely to remain economically disadvantaged. And I just want to say that as someone who has written a lot about um, motherhood, it is so uh, intellectually and personally satisfying to read such a serious, serious work of scholarship. I believe that being a mother deserves nothing less. And I think... So to find, I, I, I actually moved away from writing about mothering. I thought it would be interesting for younger voices to come forward and for other people to write. And I've written about it a long time. I also had other things, frankly, to, that I was really interested in. But in a way, I've been waiting for a voice, a certain sort of voice to come forward. And I believe that voice is better. I cannot think of a more original and radical and satisfying book, able to excavate how we have got into this pickle, and which is providing um, an illuminating um, set of signposts on how um, we might extricate ourselves and which offers hope and a way forward. Yes. doesn't need any introduction, it's the reason why we are here, but um, I've been given a list so I'll follow my list. Petra is the author of the, re of the book and the reason why we're here today. Petra is an honorary fellow at the University of Melbourne. She's a psychotherapist in private practice in North Carlton. Petra is a mother of three children, Mia, Sophia and Tom, and she lives in Bellato with her husband Nick, with her partner Nick and their children. Petra is a hobby farmer with veggies and chickens and goats. She's had dogs. She puts the kids on the school bus. She writes and she still finds time to be on the canteen roster. Please welcome Petra Thank you. Thank you so much, Beck, for that funny and warm and beautiful and 
free-ranging introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful, wonderful to remember those days. Um, they're still in my heart. And thank you, Anne, for such a lucid introduction to the work and for providing such a um, engaged and beautiful summary. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insights and reflections. Um, okay, so I too am going to work off a page because it's uh, easier at times like these. Um, okay, so thank you. Oh, okay, okay. So thank you to all who have come to help me celebrate this book. Thanks in particular go to Anne for her wonderful launch speech and for always being so supportive of my work. Anne, you are a true mentor and a true friend. Thank you. Thank you also to Rebecca for being a wonderful MC and for being part of this journey since the early 2000s in Dalesford, where, as you all now know, <laughs> we shared so many rich conversations over morning coffee at Cookler and so many wonderful dinners with our kids. This was such a nourishing social and intellectual space. Those days, those days were, as you say, the best of times and the worst of times. Thank you to my dear friend Janet, who has come all the way from the Blue Mountains in New South Wales to read her poem, which we haven't heard yet, but she's come, and I appreciate that. Um, I know you have made a big effort to be here, and I thank you with all my heart. Um, I have many more thank yous, uh, but first I want to say something about the germination of the book. Now, Anne has covered some of that material, but I thought I would go over that in terms of my own kind of experience of becoming a single mum at a young age. So it really began over 20 years ago when I had my daughter Mia as a young single mother in my early 20s. At that point, I slipped out of my milieu, that is women who had completed university education and who were entering the world of work, travel, postgraduate study and more, and entered into a new and foreign land, the land of motherhood, um, where women uh, and mothered with women 10 and more years older than me. By virtue of my age and unmarried status, I saw this land from an outsider's perspective. Certainly while women only a generation earlier had had children in their early 20s, in my generation this was uncommon <laughs> and among the university educated almost unheard of. So I entered this land as a foreigner and as a result I think I saw things that the natives miss, or at least that they normalise. Um, at the same time, I had simultaneously become an outsider among women in my own age group too. Again, this meant that I saw my peer group through new and different eyes. I don't want to romanticise this outsider status because it was actually a very painful experience. Motherhood became... Sorry, I'm rushing ahead. But I did what I've always done with painful experience, and that is turned it into an archive. Motherhood became my topic. I read voraciously and promiscuously across disciplines and genres. Women's studies, sociology, history, anthropology, philosophy, and from pop culture to high theory, all while being the primary carer of Mia. I was living the very contradictions I was observing in the literature and also in the lives of mothers around me. What was this strange set of practices we called mothering in the contemporary West? And what did I see? What I saw was the extraordinary autonomy of my child-free friends, um, which I both coveted and marvelled at. Um, when thinking about women, and more specifically um, adult womanhood, sorry, the fact that adult womanhood was, until an historical blink of an eye ago, largely synonymous with becoming a wife and mother, such that in many languages, the word for adult woman simultaneously means wife and mother. I saw this 10 years that women in the modern West have roughly between excuse me, between the ages of 20 and 30, to cultivate themselves, to explore relationships and sexuality, to become educated and develop careers if they're lucky, and marvelled at the historical novelty of it because I didn't have access to it in the same way as my peers. Um, at the same time, had I followed, I became interested in the question of freedom, which was the flip side of that. So had I followed the journey with my peers, or as sociologists say, with my cohort, by the time motherhood came around, everyone would have been tired and living around infant schedules and routines and wondering where on earth they were, how on earth they were going to combine motherhood with paid work, let alone with anything else. It would have seemed normal. So I guess what I'm saying is there was this stark contradiction. But I shuttled between worlds, between the worlds of my 20-something peers and their, from my perspective, extraordinary freedom and my married mother friends, um, home all day, or a lot of it, um, where, where many more mothers, there were many more mothers at home back then, or at least in the world I was in, in that first 12 months of the baby's lives. 
um, I was fascinated in this world um, that was kind of nestled inside the so-called real world, a world of women and children almost exclusively, of birthday parties and play dates and baby dance class, sleeplessness and ongoing illness, um, unshared domestic labour. Um, I felt more like an anthropologist than a sociologist. The world seemed completely foreign in some ways. And in trying to connect up the two worlds, I started to think not only about the peculiarity of motherhood, the sequestration to the private sphere, the unshared nature of so much of the work, um, but also of the freedom itself, of freedom that we contrasted it with. Why did we expect it to be otherwise? And what was the relationship between our cherished ideals of freedom and autonomy and the way we mother in the West? I became obsessed with this thing called freedom. So when not reading Penelope Leach and Sheila Kitzinger, I started reading Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. In the state of nature, I was told, man is born free. I think man is actually born in nappies and dependent on women. But anyway, it's an amazing idea and undoubtedly one of our best. <laughs> Reading this via Carol Pateman's brilliant and still, in my view, unsurpassed critique of classical liberalism in the sexual contract, I saw the phenomenal freedom mothers, um, that modern liberalism had given young women, myself included, and the unique constraints that mothers faced, and began to see the two factors as related, and over time, as I explore in my book, as indeed being mutually constitutive. The freedom women experienced as individuals, as Anne just explored, um, was related to the constraints they experienced or we experienced as mothers. So it was in the nexus of this contradiction, the contradiction between liberal freedom and mothering, um, that the project took shape. It was in the two worlds of my peers, young university educated women and mothers whom I joined around kitchen tables at the park at baby yoga, yeah we went to that now, um, at childcare and on occasion at university. While the research undertook interviews with a small group of mothers who periodically leave their children to pursue self-defined ends, my research archive was in fact much larger and included all the mothers I was surrounded by. I also inhabited another world, again on the margins, and that was the academic world. I wrote my honours thesis as an external student while Mia slept and in the wee hours, evoking something of Virginia Woolf's famous quote from The Three Guineas, where she says that women writers have to do their thinking while they stir the pot and while they rock the cradle. Mm. My father would come over and take baby Mia for walks around the neighbourhood while I thought about and wrote a few more words. At the time, Mia was learning to say buzz <laughs> and felt very proud of herself. She loved bees and plants and flowers, as she still does. So I wrote only in little interrupted snippets and that, <coughs> that I defined as the wee hours and the bee hours. <laughs> and after getting a first class honours degree and being asked not to take my baby on stage when I collected the test, <laughs> literally I was intercepted by a staff member who said I couldn't go on stage with the toddler in my arms. Um, my father had come over for the graduation because I was at Murdoch University in Perth at the time. So I handed her over and proceeded a bit disgruntled. But I nonetheless felt proud that I had managed this as a 22 and now 24 year old single mother. A few years later, I enrolled in a PhD at Melbourne Uni. At a prosaic level, the fact that I couldn't take Mia on stage seemed symbolic to me on, <coughs> of how I lived on the periphery with my pram and baby and books and pens and stuff, to paraphrase the maternal scholar Lisa Baretza. I wrote this thesis, which is pretty close to the book that's for sale over there on the table, <laughs> in bed while breastfeeding, in my kitchen while cooking, in cafes, the Dalesford heyday, <laughs> um, at the dinner table, in libraries. I even followed my best friend Sarah to West Papua, who was undertaking her own PhD field work while mothering three small children. I had a wonderful office downstairs that looked out onto papaya and banana trees and the most exquisite mountains. Here I wrote some more while Mia played in a large throng of Papuan kids cutting coconuts, caring for babies, um, chewing betel nut and dancing. I wrote in and around tutoring and lecturing work and training to be a psychotherapist. At this point, I put it on hold and almost gave up. That must have been one of those conversations we had. Um, indeed, my last official academic title was, quote, lapsed in good standing AWOL. Um, I have kept that and intend to frame it alongside the PhD. I wrote it across two hospital-based placements as well, a full-time lecturing job at Deakin Uni, and finally, the creation of my new family with Nick and the births of my beloved second and third children, Sophia and Tom. This project really has been my life's work. 
I stuck at it boorishly and tenaciously, even as it seemed impossible, even as it seemed interminable. Uh, securing a contract with Routledge only months after graduating from my PhD was a wonderful affirmation and made it all worth it. I think it has nourished the work to be completed in and through a life of mothering um, and working. In the neoliberal university, as Anne alluded to, um, obsessed as it is with grant applications and metrics and no downtime for academics, who were once, we should remember, called scholars, to think. I feel that single motherhood, ironically, inured me from this and allowed me the time to think and write creatively. So, um, I want to return to my thank yous now after that little <laughs> summary of kind of the book and how it intermingled with my life. There are so many thank yous with a work that has had several incarnations and began its life so many years ago. Thanks first go to my partner Nick. <laughs> for being so supportive of my work, for truly sharing care and making it possible for me to complete this project that I've been lugging around with me a long time, always inching forward but never quite having the space and time to complete it. Thank you for being a loving partner and for putting up with me. <laughs> Thank you for always taking such good care and being so thoughtful. Thank you to my children, to Mia, who by virtue of your birth set me on this fascinating journey and travelled most of it with me. In many ways, you grew up with this book, and we used to joke that it was your sibling, so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Sophia and Tom, my beautiful children, um, for giving me so much joy and inspiration. And I think I would have got rusty on this topic had I not had a second batch of kids. So <laughs> what does Helen Garner say about writers? You know, they're always using the people around them to write and think. So I hope that's um, not too bad. Um, thanks for your patience, because Tom did ask me recently, Mum, when are you going to retire? <laughs> I said, not, not for a little while. Um, thank you to my parents for generous and loving support and care of Mia in the early days, and Sophia and Tom too. And to Mum for providing me a model, really, of combining work and care. You worked full time and cared for us, and I think that that was modelled to me practically and emotionally. So thank you, and thank you for always being supportive and talking ideas and caring for the children. Um, and I wanted to thank Professor Andrew O'Reilly, who's not here, she's in Toronto, Canada, founder of Motherhood Studies, the international research organisation Mercy and Demeter Press. Um, Andrea has always believed in my work and validated it, like so many others who chose to study motherhood and experienced a raised eyebrow from colleagues. Um, Andrea created a global community of scholars to exchange ideas and at conferences to publish our work and to inform and encourage each other. I could not have done it without Andrea and so I thank her, even though she can't be here. For this I'm always grateful. Um, I would like to thank my dear friend Sarah, last but not least, whose conversation and camaraderie, whose love and loyalty has carried me through over the years. Thank you Sarah for so many shared dinners and all your support. And thank you all for being here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Petra. Our last speaker is Janet Fraser. From a musical family, Janet originally trained to be an opera singer. She also completed an honours degree in history after living a little, she then remembered her love of words infused with meaning and became a poet as well. She lives and writes in the Blue Mountains. Please welcome Janet Fraser. Thank you. Thank you to Petra. I'm just here. Oh. <laughs> uh, for your kind and generous invitation. I feel that I am in uh, amazing and illustrious uh, company tonight. I feel quite overwhelmed, actually. <laughs> if I could make that a little uh, These are for you. My study is clean. My study is clean. A title and a sentence worth saying again. It would not be, but for a friend, another mother, who also needs a space and understands my wish for space and my inability to create it. For I can write words, I can deconstruct, but sorting belongings, 
for others and cooking, cleaning, providing for others is sometimes all I can do. Sometimes I can't do those especially well. And this too is why everyone has a space in our house, except me, for I'm everywhere and nowhere and mother. For Petra. Famously barren, while tenaciously sexual, but we are the daughters of Germaine. <laughs> with our closely guarded book piles and our blue stockings with suspenders, <laughs> the daughters she never had. Maybe like Athena, we sprang from her mind. No Zeus for us though, and no hiding as a swan to rape and kidnap. And maybe one day, Vesuvius-like, we will bust the cold silicate rock and our stewing magma of rage will spew forth to cook, cover, smother, and end. Wow. Thank you, Janet. I think what we need to do now is three cheers for Petra Buskins and her new book. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Congratulations, Petra, on your achievement.